Welcome back, guys, to another episode of the JPS podcast. And this is the COVID-19 series, and this is the second installment of this series with none other than Dr. Jake Lenarden. He is uh, an expert in uh, eating psychology, and he is quite a prolific researcher and a very good friend of mine. And it was an absolute honor and pleasure to have him on the podcast to chat about many of the challenges we are now going to face due to social distancing measures, being in isolation, quarantine, lockdown, whatever it is, uh, and how these challenges of uh, being in our home environment more often uh, around family members and our living Uh, partners more than we normally would can potentially impact our eating behaviors and some of the things we need to be aware of as well as what we can do to minimize uh, the likelihood of uh, you know falling into the trap of potentially unhealthy uh, eating tendencies so Jake did a really good job in outlining uh, the current situation And what that means for us in terms of our eating and our psychology as it relates to our food choices. And he also conveyed many useful strategies that we can apply immediately uh, to ensure that we are eating in a way that's adaptive and facilitates not only our goals, but uh, our overall well-being. So I'm really uh, confident that this episode is not only relevant uh, to many of you, uh, but will be super useful, uh, very informative as as it always is with Jake and uh, I'm sure you'll all get a lot out of it, and I hope you guys enjoy. So without further ado, I present to you, Dr. Jake Lenard. Alrighty, welcome back, guys, and we have Dr. Jake Lenardin on the podcast today. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you for having me, Jacob. My pleasure. And <laughs> in what is very unprecedented times around the world, uh, people are no doubt social isolating uh, and distancing themselves from society and as a result are going to be spending more time at home uh, and a lot of behavior and environmental changes uh, will be thrust upon them given their new routine uh, if they're working from home unable to go out as much um, socially connect as they normally would and all those sorts of things and we wanted to get you on today to talk about how this will impact uh, individuals' eating uh, behaviors and their psychology around food as well as body image. So first, uh, do you want to give, I guess, a bit of a background as to some of the characteristics uh, surrounding eating disorder pathologies and the different type of Mm -hmm. uh, eating disorders and how they might be affected by this sort of uh, isolation period? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess it's a big time for, for everyone at the moment because we're all experiencing this, this kind of crisis and we are um, all at home isolating with each other. So there's been a bit of a surge in the, in the mental health field as to what impact this is going to have towards um, us all. And there's quite a bit of concern about the impact it has on not only um, of eating related issues, but also of depression, anxiety, stress and and I guess functional impairment um, anyway. So it's good to see that people are off the ground running, trying to better understand how people are going through these these circumstances and kind of uh, simple, maybe effective self-help strategies to mitigate or prevent the onset of any of these issues. But my particular interest lies in, um, in, in eating disorder and eating disorder symptoms and what impact this can have. So we know, um, we know quite a bit now that interpersonal um, uh, problems, I guess, or social isolation is a big contributor or cause of eating disorders and, and also specific eating disorder behaviours. And the ones that most, I guess, strikingly come to mind um, uh, is binge eating. So we know binge eating essentially just means eating a really large amount of food in a short period of time while simultaneously kind of feeling out of control or out of body experience. Mm-hmm. as well as the various compensatory behaviours as well. So we know many people practice things like self-induced vomiting. Um, they take laxatives to kind of shed the, the water weight people experience. And um, uh, that's also diuretics as well. And there's obviously the compulsive and the driven exercise, which is a little bit more tricky um, given that we're all in, uh, all in isolation mode, but people do find themselves um, still exercising. So I think compulsive exercise will still be relevant. And the final... Uh, behavior would be the really restrictive eating as well 
um, the way in which people can get control over their food dieting and their eating as well is by, is by severely limiting the amount of food that they have. So essentially we're in a really interesting time at the moment where people are almost they're stuck at home um, unless, you know, unless you know, going shopping for food and, and um, I don't even know what the rules are that they've set in place right now. I probably shouldn't know that. But we're essentially at home for a very long time and, and it has the, a real problem to um, cause and, and I guess maintain these various eating disorder symptoms. And it'd be nice maybe to just touch on, I guess, the reasons as to why this is the case mm-hmm. and, um, and maybe just talk a little bit about some evidence towards, uh, towards what's going on in these particular instances as well as some um, effective self-help, self-help strategies that people could, could use in these kind of times of crisis, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. So uh, when it comes to the, the research behind this, uh, what have been the primary contributing factors to, well, let's say, binge eating disorder um, that would be most uh, impacted by this uh, social isolation? Um, yeah. We, I know we had a conversation last week where we were talking about loneliness um, and mm. how that can be a contributing factor, as well as uh, interpersonal relationships, so how people make uh, you feel, um, and especially yeah. if you're isolated with someone who might make you feel um, you know, a certain way and, uh, you feel negative emotions when you're around that person being with them more often could be quite, uh, deleterious to your eating behaviors. Uh, so what does research sort of suggest, uh, in this, uh, domain and then what are the strategies that we can use to, uh, I guess, navigate those situations? Mm. So I guess, um, I'll preface this by saying that, uh, prior, luckily we have a fairly good idea what's contributing to these kind of problem eating patterns um, because we've been there's a whole body of of literature looking at the role of interpersonal functioning and and social connectedness and eating disorder symptoms so we're kind of I guess well equipped to deal with this issue these issues prior to this um, uh, social isolation happening so that's good in that regard so I guess the theory and and also to that there's an entire treatment um, it's called interpersonal psychotherapy uh, which de- it's, a, it's an entire treatment developed for eating disorders, particularly bulimia and binge eating disorder, um, that is entirely focused on people's interpersonal uh, functioning, their interpersonal relationships. And there's a really good body of evidence supporting the effectiveness of this treatment approach, suggesting or it provides further evidence of the importance of interpersonal um, the interpersonal environment as well. So I guess that I just wanted to kind of... Um, put that up front before getting into the, the, the details of that. So throughout the, the literature, we've identified, I guess, four um, broad types of interpersonal domains that, that affect eating disorder symptoms. And those domains include grief. So when people, uh, I guess, lose you know, the death of, of a significant other or even the loss of a relationship um, counts as grief. We've also got role transition, where people trans- transition or move through different kind of roles throughout their life that has an interpersonal component to it. We've got role dispute, which is when we're really talking about the conflict that people have. So people might get into, they might have arguments with their partners or their friends, their spouses. And then the final one is interpersonal deficits. So that's when people um, generally have relatively poor social skills. They, they, they don't pick up these cues quite well. And those four interpersonal domains kind of merge together to what we call a negative social evaluation. Mm -hmm. So negative social evaluation is essentially it's actual or perceived negative feedback regarding one's standing towards uh, or one's role towards a person or a group of people. So I guess the key point there is, is the, is the actual versus the perceived. It doesn't matter whether these things are actually happening. They're overt and you can spot them. It's people's interpretation of their events, uh, events as well. If people interpret that others don't really like them or if they're not doing well socially, that is an also major contributor to these issues that I'll then go on to about. So essentially, we've got those four domains that converge onto what we call these negative social evaluations. And then it's that negative social evaluation that then branches off into two other kind of risk factors as well. So in, on one side, these negative social evaluations cause, quote unquote, um, real uh, large deficits in self-esteem. So self-esteem, what we're talking about there is a global, how people view or judge themselves as a person. And then on the other hand, it, uh, these negative social evaluations cause 
negative affect. So that's when we experience those symptoms of depression, that loneliness, that anxiety, and all those kinds of uh, those bad mental health things. So it converges onto that way, and they're the mechanisms by which that indirectly affects eating disorders. Yep. So what I mean by that, it's the negative social evaluations. Yes, there's been evidence showing that directly contributes to these eating disorder behaviours, but what, what we know more is that it contributes to these eating disorder behaviours via its connection with self-esteem and negative affect. Mm -hmm. So think of it as going, it's a chain of events that are happening. People experience these interpersonal problems, whether it's grief, transition, conflict, then that kind of triggers that negative social evaluation. So that perception of that, hey, I'm not doing well in relation to my group and my standings. Then that triggers either or self-esteem deficits or interpersonal, or sorry, negative affect. And it's those two variables together that are working together to then trigger the eating disorder behaviors that we spoke about. So the things like the binge eating, the purging. And the reason why people engage in these harmful eating behaviours, there are a couple of reasons. Um, first, it really ser it serves as an affect regulation strategy. And by that, I mean these things that we're all experiencing, are they're not pleasant to experience. We don't like having fights with people. We don't like feeling really, really bad about ourselves. We don't like feeling depressed. So what we try to do is we try to mask those things. We try to kind of suppress them or escape from them in one way. And a good way to do that, according to these people, is to binge eat. Because when you eat, you are kind of consumed by the food and you can throw all those negative stuff away temporarily because you're so consumed on the highly palatable and tasty foods that you're focused on that for that point in time. But the problem is that there's a feedback loop that goes on. Mm -hmm. As soon as we finish the binge eating, which gives us that temporary, temporary relief, we go back to the start. And that influences, that triggers even further shame, negative affect, self-esteem. And then it can also contribute to problems in interpersonal problems as well. So I guess they're the key mechanisms or the pathways by which our interpersonal connectedness or loneliness contribute to those eating disorder symptoms down the track. Mm -hmm. And in terms of uh, the strategies that we can use to, I guess, navigate some of those mechanisms, because no doubt people are going to experience a lot of grief. There's many people who are out of work now, uh, unable to yeah. pay their bills, their mortgages. They're not able to socialize and see loved ones. Uh, you know, I know, for example, uh, you know, my nonna I now have to call. She just got an iPhone so that she can do video calls. Like we can't go see her. Mm. Uh, that that affects uh, you know people in a number of different ways, as well as yeah. obviously the changes that come with um, you know working from home and being exposed to that food environment and you know potentially mm. having a very um, you know stressful time uh, you know in the home environment when you wouldn't otherwise be there as much with the people that you live with uh, if you were able to, you know, go and do the regular things that you do each day. Um, yeah. I know a number of our friends have been getting on each other's nerves, um, you know, because we're stuck inside with each other. So uh, what are the strategies people should use? Are they different for each domain uh, that you spoke about earlier, the four different domains? Uh, or are there sort of strategies that apply more broadly to the entire range of uh, domain sort of specific issues that they face. What's uh, mm -hmm. your thoughts on that? Um, I think it can be, I think there's a, there's to, it's a bit of both ways. There are some strategies or some techniques specific to these uh, problem domains. And there are also some strategies that are more generalist that we've known that, that we've shown to work in, in these situations. So really people who have really, um, large social deficits, the same strategies that we apply for people that don't have these social deficits are also relevant as well. So there are a couple of things that people can work on if they find themselves in these situations. And I guess the, the one of the big ones is when we are stuck in the situation that we're in, what happens is we don't find ourselves getting a lot of positive reinforcement. A lot of people would be out of jobs. A lot of people would be out of, um, you know, out of jobs, lost contact, not so much lost contact, but the amount of social contact that they have at the moment is, is probably limited. There are a variety of other things, the uncertainty and the anxiety surrounding the situations that are going on. So as a result, what we tend to find is not only that, not only are that we kind of being punished in, in the behavioural principle terms, meaning that we're um, doing something that's, we're getting punished for it. 
No, I just lost my train of thought. But anyway, we are not um, being positively reinforced for our usual behaviours that we're doing. And that's a really big issue because one of the main components of treatment for depression and loneliness and social isolation is behavioural activation. And behavioural activation just essentially means um, finding yourselves a range of activities to engage in that bring about positive reinforcement. And the idea is that if we're able to bring about positive reinforcement, it then spirals further and further into more happiness and more social connectedness. That, yeah. That's it in a very brief nutshell. So that's been taken away from us at the moment. So we need to try to find ways in which we can still develop positive, re which we can still be reinforced positively um, to essentially indirectly tackle these problem eating patterns. And there are a range of things that we can implement. So things like, you know, home exercises is great because, you know, you want to try to make it fun, enjoyable, um, and make yourself accountable. And it provides you some sense of um, accomplishment throughout the day. And that gives us positive reinforcement, and something to fo shift the focus away from rather than being stuck and isolated and anxiety. And we know there are a whole bunch of benefits to do with exercise and mental health. So exercise has been causally linked to depressive reductions, um, et cetera. There are also other things that we can do in addition to those core activities. And there are things like a bunch of affect or emotion regulation strategies. So I like to bring it back to mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness, uh, it gets a little bit of a bad rap in kind of the scientific community, but I think there is emerging empirical support for mindfulness. And what I mean by mindfulness is it's not your... A part of mindfulness, yes, is meditation. But people often equate meditation with mindfulness. They're, they're very different things. Meditation is one way to achieve mindfulness, but mindfulness is more broadly staying in the present moment and accepting what's going on right here, right now, and not trying to think too far ahead or predict the future. Mm -hmm. We're in a massive state of uncertainty at the moment where we're trying to predict what will happen in the future. It can be a little bit unhelpful for people to try to always assess what's going on or what's going to happen when we, nobody knows the answer to that. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. So one useful emotion regulation tool is to practice mindfulness-based exercises because that keeps you grounded. It kind of it, it's an automatic um, reduction in anxiety in that point in time, and because of that, we're after we're in a mindfulness state, we are able to more clearly think about the situation at hand, and rather than automatically resulting to episodes of overeating, binge eating, and emotional eating, we're much more able to make careful decisions once we're in that mindful space state and there are many many um, apps out there that help teach mindfulness i like the one called um headspace i've actually downloaded it myself and there's been a few randomized control trials evaluating headspace and it's shown causal links with reductions in depression anxiety stress and various well-being so if anyone's listening and they're finding themselves you know struggling to deal with emotion regulation struggling to deal with their emotions um, perhaps giving that kind of app a go. It's, I know it's freely downloadable. Um, so mindfulness is a key strategy there. And also compassion-focused exercise as well. It sounds, you know, a lot of the time when you explain compassion, I kind of cringe to myself because it does sound pretty corny. It's kind of, you know, saying to yourself, you want to be, you know, comp self-compassionate, you want to love yourself, appreciate who you are for who you are. I understand talking about that it does sound corny, but there is good evidence showing that it works. That if we're able to practice that and it becomes automatic to us, then over time we're much better able to handle these stressful situations, both both interpersonally and you know in isolation as well. So compassion focused exercise is a good one. And, and something that comes to mind is, you know, I, I always like, you know, when I kind of uh, deliver an intervention, I always include some component of gratitude. Gratitude is a really simple yet effective exercise for helping people in the here and now because that's what we're wanting to do in these times of kind of crisis, the here and now, where gratitude is just simply thinking about the things that you're thankful for, thinking about what you are kind of, what you have that other people may not have and how you're lucky to have what you have. Again, it does sound a bit like uh, a little bit, um, what's the word? Uh, it does sound a little bit fluffy duffy, but... It has been empirically shown to, to work. And, you know, simply, you know, journaling 10 things that you're grateful for um, has been shown to immediately improve mood, body satisfaction, and anxiety levels. And the, these, don't, these kind of strategies don't work for everyone. They work for some people and not the others. Unfortunately, as of yet, we don't, we're not able to predict who will respond to which strategy or not. 
So that's not to say we can't give them a go and we can't try them. And if it doesn't work for someone, then so be it. Then you want to kind of move on to another strategy that could work for you. So what we like to do as mental health kind of professionals, we like to set out a broad range of strategies for people to have a go at and to see what works for them and what doesn't work for them. Because ultimately, they're the experts themselves. They know themselves the best and they will know what works for them. So so things like compassion-focused strategies, mindfulness-based interventions, um, and also cognitive restructuring is a big one as well. So testing the validity of your beliefs. So, you know, testing the, the, the claims that you make about yourself. So if you, for instance, um, you know, people have the false belief that if they eat after 6 p.m., they will automatically gain weight. Well, how about you, you know, if we're trying to modify people's thoughts and behaviours around that, how about you test that belief? Why don't you try to eat something after 6 p.m. and then test your belief? Weigh yourself and see if you've actually put on those two kilos that you believe to be. So what we want to do is we want to restructure some of these thoughts. The way in which we do that is by directly testing them, testing the validity and the content of those thoughts. Yeah. So I guess they're the, they're, the, they're the common self-help strategies that come to mind when I am thinking of um, the times that we're all facing in terms of social isolation, perhaps loneliness, anxiety, and kind of mood disturbances because they all have an impact on people's eating pathology. So if we're able to target these risk factors, then what should happen then is that the eating disorder symptoms shouldn't exist or they shouldn't come about. I know it's much easier said than done, but that's the theory behind it. Fantastic. And when it comes to, I guess, the more uh, specific food environment uh, and how people would manage a binge in in this context, uh, because I know that's obviously a topic that is uh, of greater importance and interest to you and one that you'll be able to offer some very useful insights to. How should people go about designing a home environment uh, that will minimize the likelihood of them binge eating or give them the most uh, control to regulate uh, their eating behaviors. What, what are your tips around that? Mm. And given that now um, you know, individuals aren't going to be able to go outside to exercise uh, or even go and you know, socialize or see a psychologist, for example, um, you know, how does the current landscape uh, due to the COVID-19 um, you know, social isolation policies impact people's strategies uh post binge what what's your Mm. yeah yeah that's a that's a that's a good one actually um so i always say to people that binge eating is predictable we're able to we're able to predict when an an episode of binge eating will happen and who is likely to binge eat so i spoke already about the negative affects that's a major contributor to binge eating and then the other major contributor to binge eating and i guess overeating tendencies is, is dieting, so dietary restraint. And when I'm talking about dieting in this instance, I'm talking about the real rigidity kinds of diets. So the diets that kind of consist of heaps of different food rules, and these food rules tell us, they essentially force us to eat, um, uh, they force us to tell us when to eat, what to eat, and also how much to eat. That's the kind of way I like to think about food rules is broken up into those three categories. Yep. So dieting becomes an issue when it's, one, it's inflexible, and two, and it's, it's extreme. And then it's an issue in terms of that a direct, it's a direct cause of binge eating problems. And there are many mechanisms by, by which this happens. One is associated hunger and related cues. So people just can't stand the physiological deprivation anymore. So they need to compensate by indulging. Uh, another mechanism is that all or none dichotomous thinking. So the, the multiple strict food rules that people have They've got hundreds, right? And the person is bound to break one of those fruit rules now and again, just one of them. And it's that broken fruit rule that essentially causes people to say to themselves, well, what the hell? I've already ruined my diet. Let's just go all out tonight. I'll binge eat and then I'll start fresh tomorrow. That's the other kind of mechanism that happens. So the problem here, and if people are finding themselves in an environment where they've got an abundance of food and they're stuck at home, the problem here is not so much the availability of food, it's the the perception or the interpretation people have of food. And the interpretation usually is that some foods are off limits and some foods are are on limits. And we know as kind of humans that when we say we're not allowed to do something, we're more likely to seek out that that thing. 
as soon as we say we're not allowed to do something, we, we become tempted to do that. And that's the exact thing that happens with dieting. We say we're not allowed to eat chocolate, for example. We are more likely to crave chocolate than someone let, who allows themselves to eat chocolate. You know, it may be in a controlled fashion or it may not be, but we know that the person who completely excludes it is going to be worse off in terms of their mental, mental health and binge eating related issue. So my kind of recommendations or strategies for people who are fighting this kind of issue is you need to target or address the inflexible nature of your dieting strategies. And the, 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 the component or the strategy that has the most efficacy or the most empirical support is the cognitive restructuring that I spoke about earlier. So what I mean by that is people will have a bunch of different food rules that they have. Let's, let's go with the food exclusion rule. So they've got a bunch of different foods that they exclude from their diet. Chocolate, cake, pasta, whatever, all the carby and the high fatty types of foods. So you don't, as a, as a, as a mental health professional and, and particularly as someone who I'm a strong advocate for cognitive behavioral therapy, um, I don't want to immediately say to the person, don't worry about those food rules, go and have whatever you want. Go and allow yourself, get rid of them. No, no, we have to take a more balanced approach to that and we need to take it slow. Because mm-hmm. if you, you immediately start saying to someone who has really bad problems with eating, you say to them, let's get rid of your food rules, eat whatever you want, then all chaos, all hell will break loose. Imagine telling someone who struggled from binge eating for 15 years, let's allow every single food back into your diet at once. And they'll take that as they'll listen to a mental health professional, professional they'll go, right, okay, I'll do that, cool. What's the first thing that they're going to do when they allow themselves these food? They're going to binge eat. There's, there's almost no doubt that these people will binge eat. So what you need to do is take a slow and balanced approach and you've got to kind of put a hierarchy set in place where I like to think of it as listing, getting someone to think about all their forbidden foods and listing them from the least forbidden to the most forbidden. Or in other words, the least scariest to the most scariest. Yeah. So you might have a bunch of forbidden foods, but on your list, cheese might be on there, but you'd be relatively okay with consuming a little bit of cheese compared to if you were going to consume chocolate. So if someone had that, and, they, and I might say to them, right, rank cheese up the top. That's something that you might be able to get by with eating without not triggering a binge and without thinking of that all or none approach, I may as well go and binge now. So thinking of that hierarchy of foods and generating a list, and that list comes from the least scariest to the most scariest foods. And what you want to do essentially is you want to start from the least scariest list and slowly reintroduce those foods back into your diet. And that can be one at a time. You don't want to go too hard too soon because as soon as you start incorporating many different scary foods, quote unquote, then you will... um, essentially go all out and then you'll, you know, you, you'll binge eat. So I like to say, okay, let's start on cheese, for example, and let's go to the shops and go buy a block of cheese or something like that and store it in your house so you're not tempted. It's important at the moment not to have all these abundance of food choices in the house as well at that point in time, early on in the stages of the intervention, because then that will just lead to a bunch of temptations and then that will trigger the binge. So then it's good to have... It can, but this could be tricky as well because people also live with other people in their families too. Yeah. So that, that's a little bit of a different story. But essentially what you want to do is you want to start from the least forbidden foods and work your way up. So every day allow yourself a piece of that forbidden food in your diet until eventually what you'll realise is, one, you'll realise that the forbidden food, there's no, it doesn't have to be any, any catastrophic consequences associated with those foods. So it doesn't cause immediate weight gain if you have a block of cheese. It doesn't make you fat and essentially it doesn't, um, it doesn't need to cause you so much anxiety. You realise once you have it, oh, that wasn't so bad. And then once, you've, once your anxiety has totally subsided, then you move on to the next part of the hierarchy. It takes a long time to do this, but it's a slow process. So my recommendation for people is I wouldn't stock up on all of these forbidden foods you have and put them in your house. I, I wouldn't do that because it's very dangerous to do that, particularly in this point in time. What I would do, however, is I would, I would plan carefully the types of foods you're going to buy and then slowly reintroduce those foods one at a time. And over time, you'll realise that your forbidden food list will slowly, slowly decrease and you'll get to the very end of the list where you'll allow yourself to have all these foods in your house without that immediate temptation and, amount, and without that immediate trigger for binge eating. Mm-hmm. So that is what we call essentially... Uh, cognitive restructuring and exposure-based exercise. 
and it's got the most empirical support for targeting inflexible dietary restraint and also for targeting anxiety symptoms as well. But it does take a lot of time to implement and, and heaps and heaps of patients. Fantastic. And have you uh, obviously been in the research, I'm sure you're not uh, too familiar or up to speed with what's happening on uh, ground zero in terms of what practitioners are doing uh, now that they're no longer able to see patients. Um, but are psychologists uh, moving towards telehealth during this time? And are you aware of any other ways uh, such as apps that could be used uh, during this period for people to help deal with binge eating or managing like their dietary restraint, uh, becoming more self-aware mm. with these kind of uh, internal behaviors? Absolutely. Um, yes. Yeah, so I've read a couple of things where, because we can't go to the, I don't think we are allowed to go to the psychologists. Like I think it's only medical professionals and, and GPs and stuff yeah. and, and other stuff. But, um, but yes, psychologists are certainly now moving towards telehealth. So you can now see a psychologist um, via Skype and via face to face. A lot of the services are essentially offering um, that and it makes essentially when you think of it, it makes no difference, doesn't it? You're still talking to a person, you can still see them in real time and live. So, um, I would highly recommend that people shouldn't stop seeing their mental health professional um, in this time. In fact, they should actually seek them out if they're vulnerable to these particular instances. And I would highly recommend using the tally help approach uh, because there's no difference and there's no evidence to suggest that it's inferior to face to face treatment because you're essentially doing the same things. Alternatively, if, and, and the issue with that though is that it can be expensive. We know that seeing a psychologist can range from $200 to $300 or even more, and people need to see them multiple times, you know, even once weekly sometimes. So there are other ways in which we can kind of uh, eliminate or reduce these costs related and geographical related barriers, and that's through technology. So things like internet-based programs, mm. smartphone apps, uh, we're actually running in a trial at the moment, testing and evaluating the efficacy, effectiveness of our binge eating smartphone app. Unfortunately, we've stopped recruiting because we've had a massive number of people enrolled. So we've had to kind of um, prevent, you know, we had to stop recruiting at this point in time, which is good because it's highlighting the demand for these types of things. Mm. But, um, but there are many different apps out there available to target depression, anxiety, um, binge eating. I've actually got an article on, on the Break Binge Eating website that lists a bunch of empirically supported smartphone apps for people to download if they're interested. And, um, but in the very, very short future, within about a month or so, um, our research team is, is um, recruiting for another randomized control trial of a, of a web, a computer-based program that's designed to tackle inflexible dieting and inflexible dietary restraint. So it incorporates a structured program that I talked about, about that cognitive restructuring, that exposure exercises I just mentioned there. So we've got that set in stone where, where people, which we're going to trial that program to see if it works and we need to see if it works before we can release it to the community. We don't want to, the problem a lot of people have is they develop these apps and these programs. They don't test it. They just throw it out to the community and we've got no idea where it's causing people harm um, in the first place. So what we need to do first and what the appropriate way to do is, is test it and evaluate it first, establish whether or not it's effective, and then if it is effective, then we can disseminate to the community. And that's what we're doing with the Break Binge Eating app at the moment. And I think the signs are looking promising in terms of the effectiveness of it. And once we've established the effectiveness of it, uh, we're hoping to, to offer it to people in the community um, as, a, as a cost-effective way to, to deal with these problems. Fantastic. And doctor, where can people find you uh, to access more of your information and get a hold of uh, all the content uh, that you're putting out for free? Uh, where's the best place to find you? I like that you call me doctor. You never call me. You never call me doctor, Mister Scaffers. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So if you're interested in, in some of my stuff, obviously I'm, I'm from uh, Break Binge Eating on both Instagram, um, which is at Break Binge Eating. And also we've got a website, it's obviously called Break Binge Eating as well. So we've got numerous articles that really touch on these types of things that we spoke about, to the range of different eating disorders, all of these self-help techniques, um, you know, general statistic trends, prevalence, and things like that. So, you know, if you're interested, I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to, con you know, if people send me an email, contact, want to chat about these things, I'm always down. It's kind of my livelihood at the moment. 
And, you know, I'm stuck in isolation. So I'm finding myself working more and more at the moment and it's good to kind of keep the mind off things. So if you're interested, yeah, definitely come check us out because me and Jacob do quite a lot of work together and, you know, we've collaborated quite a bit and it's great to get these, great to essentially spread the word out with, with particularly Jacob's platform as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Doctor. And guys, be sure to go and check Jake's stuff out. Uh, thank you for coming on. I uh, hope all of you took plenty away from this and we'll see you all next time.